Hello, this is Pastor Max. It's already fall. The sun is shining really nicely. And sometimes it rains here. So the rainy season seems to be back again. I hope you're all healthy and at peace in the Lord. Today is the third part of our time on Michelangelo. The first time was Rondanini Pietà, in which we looked at the image of Jesus and what we would become. And the second time was the creation of Adam, in which we looked at the image of God in us. This time we're looking at Michelangelo's famous sculpture, which you may recognize as David. Like the ancient Greek statues, his body is rightfully muscular and proportioned. We talked a little bit last time about Renaissance humanism and how rather than simply rejecting God, Michelangelo's humanism seems to be focused on recovering and discovering man as a perfect creature in the likeness of God's perfection. If you recall, Today's sculpture of David by Michelangelo can be seen in the same context. So, the work title is David. And in what context is this David? The biblical David, right? This is David right before he fights Goliath. You know the story, right? Let's read the relevant passages together. 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 50. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed it. Amen. Today's reading is very famous one. David, Goliath, and David's victory. It's also the scene where David is officially recognized as king by the Jews. David's introduction, is, introduction itself is in chapter 16, the chapter before, but it's in this scene that he really comes into his own as a leader. The story is quite simple. Israel was ruled by Saul, and after Saul fell before God, the prophet Samuel anointed a boy, David, to be the next king. In the meantime, the Philistines were fighting Israel. The Philistines then and the Palestinians now, and the Israelis then and Israelis now, are two very different people. Let, let me say that again. The Philistines and Israel back then are not the same as the palestinian Israelite conflict today. So we should never use today's text to cheer for today's Israel or curse Palestine. Anyway, on behalf of the Philistines, a fearsome champion named Goliath shows up and insults Israel and God. 
and no one steps up to do anything about it. Then David steps in, throws a stone, his Goliath in the forehead, and defeats him. It's a scene that gets a lot of people faith excited. Yeah, we love to win. And there's something very cathartic about it, especially when we beat someone who seems unbeatable. The story of David and Goliath has become a, the archetypal tale of triumph over the odds. It's often used as a metaphor even by people who don't know the Bible. When you think about it, we all crave and crave victory in real life. In fact, we spend a lot of a lot of our lives losing. It's a tough life. We lose to ourselves, as there is a saying about the shortened days of New Year's resolution. We live a life there where we have to beat others in all kinds of competitions to survive, just to survive. And how much do we win? Not only do we lose to ourselves, but we also lose to others. If we live by the word, we should be used to being last rather than first, right? Or losing rather than trying to win. But our emotions, even as believers, make losing very upsetting. Well, it feels good to win. And it's even cathartic to lose a lot and then win, right? We want to win, not just against the devil, but against everything and anything. I hate to lose too, and I love to win. I like to see the side that I think is on, on my side win. Yeah, I went to um, the Chase Center in San Francisco. Yeah, and they, they chant warriors, warriors, yeah. It's really exciting. But maybe we should have a winning faith rather than just obsess over, over the cathartic victory itself. In a cutthroat, competitive society, if you win everything because, of, because you have faith, what makes you any different from any, everyone else? Is it really persecution of your faith when the world laughs at you and says, you're always trying to win, or like, you're a douchebag? Well, it seems self-inflicted self to me. And what about if you lose of competition because of the victory obsessed attitude of people faith described above? You hear things like, oh, you lost it and you even though you have faith. You don't have to be a loser to lose. But how often do you end up being a loser? What are we really doing? Again, it's not so much about the outcome as it is about the attitude toward winning which is what faith is all about. Don't you believe that there is a final victory at the end of the faith? Don't you believe that our God is in control of all things? We look to our salvation on the final judgment day. So how do we have a victory attitude in, the, in here and now? We want to think about it as we watch this David and Goliath scene. The artwork we're looking at today. Michelangelo's David is a bit unusual. At first class, there's nothing there. <laughs> it's just a guy standing there and he's not even wearing any clothes. It looks like there might be something there. Well, how, how do we 
usually describe a figure of David. Well, there is also a famous work of same title by the fellow Renaissance master Donatello. And in fact, art historians often compare the two works by Michelangelo and Donatello. If you look closely at Donatello's work, the figure is also naked, just like Michelangelo's. But he got a sword in one hand, and there's a bearded head under his foot. That would be Goliath, right? Yeah. What Donatello is depicting is a scene of David, a boy, in victory. This is David in triumphant pose. That's what artists have mostly depicted, this victorious David. And it's a very last pose. But if you look at Michelangelo's compared to Donatello's, it looks a little bit more tense. There's no sword. Goliath's head isn't under his foot. He's got a cloth or leather. Well, yeah, that leather thing in his left hand and draped over his shoulder. And I don't know what's in his right hand, but it seems to be wrapped around it a little bit. For those of us who know the context of the scriptures, it's pretty, pretty clear, right? Yeah, it's David with a sling and a stone. And he's got his eye firmly on the target. It's a little more visible because of the lighting. It also looks like he's wearing a, a little bit of a skull. It's very focused, but just by the look on his face. He looks a little bit older than Donatello's David. So he's got a bigger skeleton than the skinny boy David. And he's got more muscles. Michelangelo makes the tension in his muscles come alive. One more thing. There's a pose here that makes this muscle tension even better, and it's called contraposto in our history term. The, the idea is that rather than just having the model stand up straight and tall, it's more lively to have them in a pose where they are stepping to one side, because as the foot moves to one side, the body contorts a little bit, and the muscle tension becomes to life. So this is what we call a good rendering of that. Donatello, for example, stomps on Goliath's head and twists his body a little bit to make it feel more dynamic. But it's not a very powerful pose because he's already won and he's stomping on Goliath's head. Michelangelo, on the other hand, is not stomping. He's He's lifting his heel and taking his foot off the ground. So now we're anticipating what's going to happen next, which is the muscle tension right before he lifts his foot and twists his body and steps toward the enemy that he's glaring at and is about to throw a stone. Okay, so now that we know this, it's odd, yeah, that, that, that adds a lot to what we started with, the guy standing there with nothing, right? Doesn't it? What, what, do we, what do you think? Does it look like David is about to take a step towards Goliath to throw the stone? Yeah, that's exactly what we're looking for. We crave victory, but what we really need is to take a step toward victory. We already know this, yeah. We already know that we need to silence our crave, craving for victory. We already know that we need to take a step toward accomplishing what we've been given to do in this world. But try to remember that moment that very moment when you took 
that very step. Maybe it looks like nothing, like the first time we saw Michelangelo's David. Maybe it's just one step, just single step in a long lines of long line of steps that we know are necessary for victory. But without that one step, we get nowhere. That one prayer, that one kind word, that one step toward someone who is in need, that one thing we should have been doing at school, at work, at home, that one place, that one step. What is the place you are in right now? Ace your exams, get good grades, get a good job, get a promotion, build a business, make enough to live on, make enough to help someone. Yeah, that'll be better. And if you can't afford it, do something you think you need to do. Get married, start a family, or find meanings in your personal life if you don't have one. Yeah, the world it is about, all about competing and fighting wars and getting, yeah, to accomplish these things. Yeah, we need to win. Well, it's good to win. But in a life of faith, I want to take that one step of faith, one step of faith every time. First and foremost. And if we win, I mean, yeah, thank God. If we don't win, God will open up a new path for you if that's what you need, really need to do. Yeah. Because that's what faith is. I want you to take that one step of faith this week.